Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 2000 film Ginger Snaps, which in my opinion is one of the better werewolf films. I know I've said, um, actually I don't know what order that they're coming out. I might put Ginger Snaps review out first, but I also have a review for Dog Soldiers, which is also a pretty good one. But I said in the review for that one that, you know, there aren't a huge amount of werewolf films. I like a good werewolf film. And of the small amount of werewolf films out there, there aren't that many that are actually all that good. Now, Dog Soldiers is a pretty solid one. Ginger Snaps, I think, is even better. This one, I'm, I'm a fan. I remember the first time I saw it. Actually, this might only be like the second. No, might, maybe the third time I've actually seen it. But it's been a while since the last time. So I actually forgot a bunch of stuff about the film. So it was good to rewatch it. But uh, when I'm putting up this review, it's available, available, sorry, available for streaming on the Shutter service. So uh, this was written and directed by John John Fawcett. Yes, like a faucet. Uh, mainly he's done shows, directed shows. Um, some of the ones that people would know, Xena, Warrior Princess. Uh, and I only put down, <clears throat> excuse me, I only put down ones where he did multiple episodes of. So Xena, Xena Warrior Princess, Lost Girl, Orphan Black, and The Man in the High Castle. So, mainly just on TV, but did Ginger Snaps, did a good job with it. This was also, he did uh, directing, but also did some of the writing, but the majority of the script writing and the story idea came from Karen Walton, who's written episodes for Queer as Folk and Orphan Black as well. So, uh, Catherine Isabel plays Ginger in this. I think she has the best performance of anyone in the film. She had the most demanding role, and she did an awesome, awesome job with it. Uh, Emily Perkins as Bridget did a good job as well, <clears throat> but she's, you know, I, I think in comparison to Catherine Isabel, uh, she got kind of shown up a little bit, unfortunately, but Emily Perkins did a did a pretty good job. She hasn't really done a whole lot since, so I'm I didn't you know put anything down for her. But Catherine Isabel has gone on to to do a bunch of other horror <coughs> excuse me horror stuff. I'm still fighting things. <coughs> How long is this gonna last? I might have bronchitis. I don't know. But anyway, so Catherine Isabel was in Disturbing Behavior, Bones, Insomnia, Freddy vs Jason, American Mary, which I still have yet to see. See No Evil 2, Ginger Snaps 2 Unleashed, and Ginger, Ginger Snaps back uh, uh, back to the beginning. So, um, as you can tell, there are two sequels to this. I have not seen the sequels. I don't know if I will. I've not, <laughs> excuse me, I've not heard that I particularly need to see them. So, so this film actually had a budget of $4.5 million, and it only made $572,781 at the box office. So, I'm assuming, I mean, the majority of the support for this film has been kind of like a cult following after the fact on DVD and Blu-ray. Actually, does it even, does it have a Blu-ray? I hope it does, because here's the thing. The version that's on Shutter doesn't look as good as you would think it would for a Blu-ray, so I think it's still just DVD quality. But tell me in the comments, people, if you know if there have been Blu-rays this. I should probably buy this movie. This movie's good. So Karen Walton was initially super reluctant to actually do the script and get involved. The main reason being is she was aware of the kind of trope in in the horror genre where, you know, female characters are typically kind of weak. But John Fawcett said to her, look, we can do something totally different. We can make them much stronger characters. That's fine. Let's do it. So she agreed to do it for that reason. And you can see it in the film that these are obviously much stronger characters. Uh, around the time the movie was being worked on, they uh, had the Columbine shooting, and then there was also another school shooting in Alberta, Canada. So that was kind of like a teen violence thing was, was a big problem, especially within schools. And obviously this film has to do with some teen violence and in school, in high school. So there was a lot of backlash from people when they heard that this film was being made because it was kind of... Uh, tagged as a teen slasher film, and people were like, ooh, l r bad timing. So that may have actually played into... <coughs> in <coughs> Sorry. That may have actually played into the issue of it not doing all that well when it actually came out. I'm sorry about this. I just... This is all... I have to put the reviews out. This is all I can do. So Perkins was actually four years older than Isabel, but she ended up being cast as the younger sister. She looks like she could be the younger sister. Like, they look close enough in age 
that you could say you could go either way with it. But I just think it was kind of funny that the one who was four years older than the other one gets cast as the younger sister. But it worked, so I guess that's all that matters. Ginger's metamorphosis involved seven hours to apply prosthetics and took an additional two hours after shooting to take off. That is commitment as an actress. That probably sucks terribly. Can you imagine just sitting there for seven hours uh, having things applied to you? You have to be pretty still. Um, and then two hours to, to take it all off. Like I feel like when you're done with that, after sitting through the seven hours, doing all the shooting, you get to... You need to take another two hours. You probably just feel like you just want to start tearing it off and be like, there. But you have to keep it intact because it's got to go back on. So, but that's just crazy. The soundtrack is a good one if you like metal or harder music. I don't, some of it you wouldn't technically call metal, I don't think. But um, some of the ones, the better bands that I had uh, written down, because there's some bands on there that I kind of don't like, like Saliva. I was like, meh. But... Glassjaw, Soulfly, Fear Factory, and Hatebreed. Pretty good. It was a good soundtrack. Uh, <clears throat> so now to the actual events of the film itself. The savagely mauled dog in the beginning is a really strong way to start. It let you, lets you know that there is something very, very wrong going on in this suburban neighborhood. And they do a good job of kind of establishing that it's definitely like a, a typical-ish suburban neighborhood and then they show the problem with the dead dog and it's kind of like oh no people aren't safe because it you know it looks like oh it should it's the suburbs it should be pretty safe and then there's something awry the girls look like they live in prison because they're living in the basement first of all it makes sense for how death obsessed and how goth they are that they're living in the basement like they would choose to and they're even living in like it looks like it's a unfinished portion of the basement too even though they have a bathroom there but the walls are like gross it's very very dark i don't think there are any windows their beds look super uncomfortable they literally look like prison beds um so i just thought that was kind of interesting it keeps things very dark but it also seems weird i don't know i would i would assume that that was the sister's choice to live down there because they're so death obsessed and into like darkness and the macabre uh, their death photo shoot is actually a really awesome visual way to kind of show how death obsessed they are instead of just talking about it or, or showing it in a different way or having dialogue between characters on it. Um, it's a visual way of telling a story, and that's always better if you can do that. So it's pretty cool. Got the point through. They waste no time laying out all the crappy stuff that the Fitzgerald sisters end up having to put up with in school, being objectified by guys because they're maturing. Um, getting bullied by other girls, <laughs> girls getting kind of bullied by other guys, and then also not really being appreciated by their teachers. The whole thing with their photo shoot, you know, some of their peers see the value in what they were doing in the art artistry of it, but then the teacher's like, I'm just disgusted, this is terrible. Instead of focusing on how much time it took and how good it looks, and they could have approached it in a different way and kind of been like, this is really good, you have very good skills, maybe focus it a little bit differently, you know, instead of just being like, I'm disgusted and this is terrible because that it's such a strong reaction. It just repels the kids. So it's no coincidence that Ginger gets attacked by a werewolf as soon as she gets her period. Um, and then I wrote, here comes a very messed up and accelerated form of puberty in the form of lycanthropy. So obviously this film really um, kind of ties... Uh, female puberty and and finally getting a period to lycanthropy and kind of that confusion that goes along with the body changing it's like a very hyperbolic version of that of you know going through puberty this is very much a coming of age film like that and it's it substitutes that which is also very interesting because sometimes there's this confusion of like what's going on here it, it are some of her feelings or behaviors um attributable to her going through puberty or is it attributable to um the lycanthropy so and and ginger actually herself has those confusions as well so this is kind of a way to take it into the horror realm and show a girl going through her body changes and having a really hard time with it like really hard time with it at this point and even her sister because it, imp it impacts Bridget as well as Bridget's watching this she kind of feels like she's being left behind because she hasn't gotten her period yet she certainly hasn't been bitten by the werewolf uh, at least early on in it and yeah 
Which, by the way, spoilers in this, if I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Spoilers. Uh, all the spoilers in this one. Uh, Ginger's resistance to going through puberty seems to spawn from not wanting male attention and fearing she'll become normal. She looks around and sees at her high school how everyone else is reacting, and she doesn't want to be that. So when she gets her period, um, she really starts to feel fearful because she thinks that maybe that might take her to where these people are. Because they even make a point of saying that Bridget and Ginger are kind of behind in getting their periods. So um, they've had plenty of time to kind of see how everyone else goes through changes, other girls and guys too. And they don't like that. They don't like what those people have become. So Ginger's fear of, of becoming those people is very, very real to her because she's like, God, you know, I don't know what's going on with my body. I don't know how this is going to affect how I feel and how I behave. And I'm just afraid that I'm going to be that terrible person or that terrible person that I hate so much. And Bridget's afraid of that, too, because like I said, she's being left behind and she's just afraid that Ginger's going to become one of those people. She actually verbalizes to her that fear, <laughs> that fear at one point. And very effectively. So there's a lot going on here. It's very relationship based with the sisters. And going through lots of changes. Both of them. The classroom video about a foreign body taking over um, a cell. Is actually a very clear foreshadowing. I mean it's kind of the parallel of. This is what's being shown in the video. About a foreign body infecting someone and taking over. Meanwhile right next to, <laughs> to um, Bridget. Her sister is starting to go through the changes of lycanthropy which is like a foreign body. So, yeah. I mean, it is a foreign body because it's more looked at as an affliction and not just, you know, a monster situation. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Bridget is in a bad spot, <coughs> sorry, because she's not just watching her sister change from lycanthropy, but also changing in social behavior and status. She's losing her sister in multiple ways at this point. And that's why she reacts so harshly and she seeks help and seeks help in the, you know, local drug dealer. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Local drug dealer, dude. Um, crap. What is his name in this? Sorry, I don't even remember his name in this. Just drug dealer guy. Um, but it's very surprising that he actually ends up being a good person. It's not surprising that he ends up being smart because he's used to, you know, Kind of like botany. He's kind of into botany because he's growing all sorts of plants. And I like the relationships that's, that is forged between the drug dealer and Bridget. It's a cool one. I like that Bridget watches werewolf movies to try and figure things out. That is definitely what a high schooler in this situation would do because they, didn't, they wouldn't know what else to do. What resources do you have available? Movies. The, the flesh tail that Ginger starts getting... Especially when you first see it, when um, Bridget kind of pulls her underwear back and she sees it and she's like, uh, it looks really weird. It's kind of gross and creepy at the same time. So very effective. And then as it keeps growing and they're like, the funny moment where they're like using electrical tape to tape it to her leg, that's pretty funny. Which actually, that's very similar to when she was trying to hide her period. The fact that she was bleeding down there. Um... It's kind of a parallel, like hiding the tail, hiding the fact that she has her period. It's very interesting. She also seemed to be hiding the fact that she was getting larger breasts as well, even though it does get noticed. But she was wearing like baggier, um, baggier clothing. And in the beginning, that that one dude, McCarty, who she ends up getting it on with um, and biting a lot, a lot. Um, he notices like at that moment, it's it's supposed to kind of signal that like they're started. She specifically is starting to get noticed because she's going through her body changes because he notices. He says, oh, man, she's got a rack now. So she was obviously kind of trying to hide that as well. Um, Ginger is so confused between her period and lycanthropy. She said she thought her hunger was for sex, but it was actually to eat, to bite, to, to potentially kill. So, like I was talking about before, like, she's so confused, like, what is the change, of, the natural change in my body or the lycanthropy? Like, she can't figure it out. So, you know, that goes along with her sister, goes along a little bit with the audience. So, they do a good job of kind of letting the audience know these types of things. 
I laughed when that dude McCarty started pissing blood. His reaction to it was just really funny. And that's the other thing is like there are comedic moments in this film. Some of them that aren't supposed to be, but they play well as being funny. Other ones that were supposed to be and they are funny. There's not a ton of comedy, but when it is kind of comedic, it lands well. It does really well and it doesn't detract from the film. Um, it is interesting at this point, though, when he starts peeing blood because they're now kind of presenting lycanthropy as a sexually transmitted disease. So they've now moved it to an STD, and you kind of see it with McCarty and the way he starts to change because he gets, like, all these sores all over his face, and the peeing blood thing is, is a very clear reference to an STD, and it was sexually transmitted, even though she had bitten him as well. I assume she probably scratched him, too. Um, I don't remember if that's, like, specifically talked about, but, yeah, but it's, you know, it's insinuated that they had sex, too, because he's like, oh, she rocked my world. But in what way? I like the twist of the drug dealer actually being helpful and being a solid guy. I already talked about that, but it bears repeating. That was good. I love the moment. <coughs> sorry. I love the moment Bridget asked her mom what guys want to distract her from seeing the dead body in the freezer. That was a really good, funny moment. It, it felt awkward, but it felt funny at the same time. But, like, intentionally awkward. Like, awkward for the characters, not awkward with the way it was done. That was a good moment. Ginger's quote on categorization of females in our society was a really strong uh, statement. This is a really good quote. I wrote it down verbatim. She said, a girl can only be a slut, a bitch, a tease, or the virgin girl next door. And she basically says we should play on that because otherwise... You know, no one's going to suspect me of being a werewolf, of being the one who's killing people or killing the dogs, um, because these are the only ways you get categorized, especially as a high school girl. And for the most part, that's pretty true, I feel like. I mean, that may have changed a little bit since 2000, and I feel like to a degree it has, but at least when I was in high school, yeah, that's kind of how it was. We as a society kind of have a problem with wanting to categorize everything and everyone just to make things easier for talking about them, for thinking about them. And it's not necessarily correct. It's this kind of issue of people wanting everything to be A or B, black or white. But in reality, there's so much in between. There's so much gray matter. Life in general is almost all gray matter. Everything in between. Nothing is as neat as that is. But we always want to try and boil it down to like one or two traits and then just call it that. Whether it's a person or a thing or a group of people or whatever. And that's like, that's one of the biggest issues with our society, in my opinion, is the oversimplification of things when it shouldn't be simplified. Uh, Ginger's gradual physical changes work well and they're actually paced extremely well. Um, yeah, also her behavioral, because her behavioral changes happen gradually along with her physical changes. And I think they kind of mirror each other and it just works. The greenhouse, <coughs> sorry, Sorry, so I'm very sorry for this. The greenhouse is a cool shooting location. I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure it really makes sense because how is it that this guy who's a drug dealer, who's a high school student, has access to this greenhouse and no one really knows about it and he's like growing weed there? But it's a cool shooting location and it looks good, especially when they like dress it up for the Halloween party. It looks really cool. I just liked it as a, as a location. The end portion in the house is pretty tense. And the lycanthrope looks quite good once Ginger turns into it. Um, this goes back to another thing, and I say this during my Dog Soldiers review as well. The situation of being in a confined space, being the house, and it happens in Dog Soldiers as well, it ups the stakes. It ups the intensity of what's going on because there's only so far that you can go. In this film in particular, it's upped even more because of the fact that um, oh, Sam, that's right, that's who the drug dealer is, Sam, Sam and Bridget are going after Ginger, they're not trying to run away, so it's even more dangerous, and even if there's a point where, you know, in their mind it turns and they want to get out, it's going to be hard, so I just like that. Bridget has also changed through this ordeal, most strongly signaled when she says, I'm not dying to Ginger at the end when she's being about to be attacked, uh, she was obsessed with dying prior to that, and that's kind of the moment where you see the biggest change in her. In the be be beginning, she talks about dying. 
Uh, she's very death obsessed. And at the end, she basically sheds that. And I view it kind of as she's matured, but she's also been forced through uh, these traumatic events and through seeing her sister go through all this stuff. She's been forced to grow up. She's been forced to change her worldview. And she's been forced to literally face death head on in a few different ways and realize, I don't think I want that for me. So, uh, you potentially should have picked up on something else going on when the mother puts the fingers in the fridge. Now, when I was watching this, I originally thought that it was going to add an extra twist at the end where the mom was the werewolf who originally bit Ginger. And I think that would have been actually pretty cool to put in there and it would have worked. And I say that because I feel like the track was laid for it. Like when the mom finds the fingers and then she's like, oh, it's probably just, you know, the girls doing their their death photos or whatever. But then she puts them in a Tupperware container in the fridge, indicating that she thinks they're real fingers. Because otherwise, why would she put them in the refrigerator? That doesn't make any sense. Then she talks about, oh, I feel like this is all my fault. And then she talks about, well, we can just blow up the house, basically, and run away and start a new life. And she doesn't even want to take her husband with her. So I feel like all those things indicate that she could have been the werewolf and that the both the girls were going to turn into werewolves anyway. And Ginger being attacked just accelerated the fact that she turned into a werewolf. Now, tell me what you think about that in the comments. Do you think that would have been good with the film? I kind of wanted it to go that way. It's still good the way it is. I still quite like the film, but I felt like that little extra bit could have been good. Or maybe that's maybe that happens in the second one. I don't know. Like I said, I haven't seen it. So I love the commitment in this film to practical effects. I always love when people commit to practical effects, when they have CG at their disposal. Um, it always looks better. Practical effects always look better, especially for years, decades down the road. The script was very carefully crafted, and that really, really shows. I think Karen Walton did an exceptional job with this. You can tell that she put so much into this, so much thought, so many parallels that she puts in there. It's really, <clears throat> it's a great script, to be honest. So I rip, this is a coming-of-age film that uses the confusion and pain of lycanthropy as a substitute for puberty, although puberty is also happening, which, like I was talking about before, creates that kind of confusion for everyone involved, and including the audience, of, is this puberty, is this lycanthropy, or are they kind of one and the same in this instance? So, And then my final thing... The use of the word lycanthrope in this instead of werewolf shows intent to paint those with it as afflicted and not just monsters. Werewolf is the monster itself and the end result. Lycanthropy is an actual condition. And it's even kind of tied in, like I was saying in the, in the, um, when they're watching the video about the foreign body attacking cells in class, like it's drawing that parallel between lycanthropy and a foreign body. So it's showing it as kind of a disease, a condition, and people who have it are afflicted. It's not their fault. Whereas if they just focus on werewolf, you're just focusing on the end result of the change, of the disease, the condition, and it's just a monster. So I thought that was very interesting that that was a very intentional choice to always say lycanthrope and not say werewolf. So just saying... Uh, and that's all I have for the film. I quite like this. Like I said, it's not a perfect film. It's not the best film I've ever seen, but it's, I enjoy it. So, uh, how many stars to give this? Out of five stars with half stars in play, I'm going to go ahead and give this four stars. Uh, I quite like it. I, I was between four and four and a half. Uh, the directing's good in this too, which I forgot to say as well, but um, yeah, I'm going to give it a four. I was between four and four and a half. If I did quarters, I'd do 4.25, but I don't. So I'm going four, uh, really good rating. Um, quite like this film Recommend it to everyone. Like I said, one of the best, in my opinion, werewolf films. I love American werewolf in London. Like everyone does love the howling. Like everyone does dog soldiers is a good one. I think ginger, ginger snaps is better. So, um, are there any other ones I'm missing? I don't like Bad Moon. I have a review for Bad Moon on my channel, so you can check that out. I don't like it. There are some other ones I haven't seen yet that I've heard good things about, like Wolfen. I also haven't seen Howl, which that's coming to Shudder, I know. So 
put some comments down there. Let's talk about this film. Let's talk about werewolf films in general. Give me your favorite werewolf films. I want to know because if I haven't seen them, I should go looking for them. Uh, and then please hit that subscribe button. If you're not already subscribed, that's your way to repay me for doing any of these videos. If you like what I'm doing, it's quick and painless for you. It means a lot for me. Uh, and if you're already subscribed, just hit that like button to let me know you're still watching and you want to encourage me. But uh, thanks everyone for checking this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.